when we compare ourselves, how does it feel? It feels really crap. It feels <laughs> shit because Ooh. it is stopping you from being the best version of you. It is blocking your flow. It is stifling your creativity. Melissa Ambrosini, welcome to Women of Impact, homie. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. I have watched Women of Impact for so many years and I'm so excited to be here right now with you. Well, girl, we're going to go deep on comparisonitis, the deadly disease that so many of us have. And I actually really want to start with a fire quote of yours. Make no mistake, Comparisonitis is a toxic disease that's eating us up and spitting us out, leaving us paralyzed with fear, crippled with guilt, and with our confidence in tatters. Ooh, so I really want to talk about the impact that comparison has on our self-worth and how we see ourselves. And where I want to start is the story that you tell in your book of how you're a dancer and you're standing in line and the teachers literally look your body up and down and pull it apart in front of hundreds of other women. Yes. Talk, tell me that story. Well, that happened many times with different variations from casting directors to agents to teachers. So that happened many different in many different scenarios. And I would go to sometimes eight or nine auditions and castings a day uh, as a dancer. And I did TV presenting and acting. And so I would go to all of these castings every single day. And this one particular one was for a dancing job. And at the end of once we had performed and it, they had cut all of the other girls that were not uh, ideal for this, for that particular gig, they lined us up in a line and they literally walked down the line saying too tall, too thin, too fat, thighs too big, eyes too far apart, mousy hair, not ideal. And no matter how many times I walked out of an audition or a casting and didn't get the job and would tell myself, you know, they wanted a blonde or maybe I was too tall or maybe I was too short. No matter how many times I tried to rationalize it for myself, it still hurt and it still ate away at my confidence and my soul. And it wasn't until later when I ended my career, I realized that every no that I got along my journey slowly chipped away at my self-confidence and my worth. And, you know, it's a very fickle industry. <laughs> but it has given me the confidence that I have now. And I'm, I'm grateful for all of those experiences because it has shaped me into the person that I am now. Ooh, okay, I really wanna dive deep into that girl because I understand that everything can be beautiful in hindsight, right? That you wouldn't be here where you were today or where you are today if all of that hadn't happened. But take me back then now because I'm thinking of the person who is listening to this, the girl who is really struggling with her body image, with her self-worth, where she can't help but compare herself to others and that comparison is really tearing her apart. Now it's beautiful to say, right? Like, don't worry, in the future, like it, can be amazing and you can be grateful for it but it doesn't feel right right now so talk to me about how you felt when that happened what that led to and then we can dive into how we can start to unwind that it really hurt in the moment really hurt and I didn't have the awareness that I have now to kind of even know what I was upset about. I just knew that I would, I walked away and I went home and I would feel really down and flat and crap about myself. I would binge eat. Um, I would not eat, you know, it led to a lot of disordered eating. So not eating and then binging and making myself sick. And I spiraled into a very uh, deep depression and a very unhealthy relationship with my body and food. And that's taken years to unravel. And since having a daughter, like she is 13 months now, it is such a big mission and passion of mine to 
not bring her up in a world where body comparison is is par for the course. It's it doesn't have to be her reality. So how I model that for her is very different to how I grew up, which I'll share with you in a moment. But it's really, really sad that we tear ourselves apart, that we pick apart every single freckle, bump, blemish on our body. We tear ourselves apart and our children are watching that. (laughs) So that's how they learn. So in order to heal the generations coming after us it starts with us which i'll talk about later but we really need to look at our own relationship with ourselves and with our body and if you knew who you truly are which is an absolute miracle there is one in 400 trillion chances that you were born that your parents got together the egg and the sperm from them came together and created you. One in 400 trillion chances. That is a miracle. And you matter. And you are here on earth for a reason. And when we know this, when we remember this, when we remember that we are a miracle, we will stop tearing ourselves apart. We will stop picking every blemish, pimple, freckle, bump on our bodies apart. And in the book, there's four main areas where we compare ourselves to others. And one of them is body comparison. And I think now with social media, it is rife. We are exposed every day to so much data, to so much information, constantly it's being bombarded at us. So we really do need to be discerning with the content that we consume. And if you are struggling with body comparison and social media is a really big trigger for you, I talk about in the book, setting some healthy boundaries for yourself so that you can come back to your truth so that you can heal whatever it is that you need to heal and then you can step back out into the social media world once you're feeling confident and strong within yourself so that then you can look at social media and not feel like you have to tear yourself apart all right that's so amazing and now i want to piece apart how we actually go about doing that because you said something very powerful right at the beginning which was the awareness piece Go. I don't know how many people don't even realize what they're saying to themselves about themselves. Literally, like two years ago or something, I was walking by the mirror and I was like, oh God, here we go. Your ass is like soft and flat again, Lisa. And I was like, oh my God. I literally just paused and I was like, how often do I insult myself? So I really want to nail down because to your point, people may not even realize that they're doing it that then becomes destructive. And now they're like, I don't know why I feel badly about myself, but it's, it all starts with the awareness piece. So how do you actually start to make people aware of the fact that they have an, um, a comparisonitis with the body? And maybe if you can actually even share with me, if, if it's not too difficult, the thought process of how you felt when you were saying that to yourself, because I've had issues with food as well. And the words and language I used to myself, dude, I wouldn't even expect my worst enemy to say that to me. It's really horrible the way that we speak to ourselves sometimes. And like you said, we would never speak to our worst enemy like that. And I think since having a daughter, It has made me so Mm. much more aware of my words because our words are spells. They are mantras and our thoughts. So our words and our thoughts create our reality, right? What we say we are going to manifest. And since having a daughter, it's the best personal development. Having children is such great personal development because it makes you so aware because Mm they copy everything you do and say everything 
And so it has made my husband and I so much more aware of the dialogue that we speak. Even things like, I can't do this. We don't say the word can't anymore in this house. We don't say busy. We don't say, Mm. oh, I'm so tired. Because these are imprinting on her. So I just wanted to say that like having children, it really makes you become super aware of everything that's coming out of your mouth and the thoughts that you think. And when I speak to myself really poorly and, and reflecting back when I did it a lot every single day, it doesn't feel good. Like everyone listening knows that when you talk to yourself poorly, when you say you're so fat, look at you, you know, whatever it is that you say, it doesn't feel good. It really closes down your confidence. It closes off your heart and you can't show up as the best version of yourself when you are closed down and when you're shut off because you know all about confidence. Like you just wrote a book on it. It's confidence is, is everything. And this doesn't mean you have to be this big, shiny extroverted on the stage, giving Ted talks and doing podcasts. Confidence is just, there's, there's a quiet confidence. And that comes from within and it radiates and permeates out through every cell. And that's what we want to cultivate. We want to cultivate that uh, quiet confidence. And it doesn't matter if people outside notice, as long as you feel good within yourself, as long as you feel confident within yourself, that's the most important thing. And so in the book, I have this four step process called the ACEs technique. And the ACEs technique helps you feel ACE again, because when you are spiraling into a deep, dark hole of comparisonitis, you feel the complete opposite to ACE. You Mm -hmm. feel crap. You feel down. You feel flat. You don't feel like the best version of yourself. So I created this ACEs technique to help you feel ACE again because I realized I was like, well, when I compare myself, I don't feel like the best version of myself. How can I get back into feeling like the best version of myself? And so I created this four step process that I teach my clients and that I now do anytime I am in comparisonitis. So the first step is a awareness. So ACEs, is, is, it's an acronym, which I'll explain the four steps, but the A stands for awareness. We have to become aware mm. when we are comparing ourselves to others. Awareness is the first step for all personal development and inner transformation, right? So A for awareness. Ladies, 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 I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dreams, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. Do you have very specific things that people can do going back to the point where sometimes people don't even realize that they're doing it? How, what are those, that, that first step to do to become aware? I think tune in to how you feel, you know, when you're on social media or maybe you're around a particular person and you're just like, oh, I don't, I don't know what Mm. it is, but when I'm around this person, I just, I feel contracted. So go exploring, like, why, why do I feel contracted? Why do I not feel like my best self when I'm scrolling Instagram? Why? Just get inquisitive and ask yourself why. Mm-hmm. And then what will come about from that is you you may come to the solution that, okay, I'm comparing myself to my cousin or I'm comparing myself to that friend or I'm comparing myself to X, Y, and Z on social media. And then what I get everyone to do is write that down. So 
where do you compare yourself? Is it social media? Is it a friend? Is it magazines? Is it movies? Is it wherever? And to who? You know, mm. I compare myself to this person um, because she's a boss babe and she's she's doing the career that I want. Or I'm comparing myself to this person because they they have got pregnant and I'm still struggling to fall pregnant, you know, three, four, five years down the line. So get really clear on where and what are your triggers because once you have shone light on something, it's no longer dark and then you can transform it. But if something's dark and you don't know why do I feel crap and mm. you, you don't know why, you can't then change it. But if you go investigating and you discover and you shine light on the comparison, you can then transform it. So the awareness is the first piece. It's the biggest piece. We have to shine mm. light on the areas that are dark or the, the shadow side that people sometimes refer to it as. So that's the first step. Then the second step in the ACES technique, C stands for choosing a different path. So what most people do is if they're comparing themselves to someone else, you either go down one path, which is I'm not good enough, they have everything, uh, and you continue to spiral down that comparisonitis. So uh, very negative, very toxic. Um, I'll never fall pregnant. I'll never meet the guy. It's not fair. It's not fair. All of that. Mm -hmm. Or the alternative is you go down the other path and you use it as inspiration, okay? Okay, well, if she can build a six-figure business, so can I. Mm. Okay, if she can get pregnant, so can I. If she can be healthy and fit and run a marathon, so can I. If she can meet her dream man, so can I. If she can have an orgasmic ecstatic home birth, so can I. So you've only got two options. You go mm. down the comparison where you beat yourself up or you go down the other one, which is inspiring and motivating. So choosing a different path, the path that you would usually go down, which is unhealthy, toxic, go down another path and use that comparison as motivation and fuel to propel you forward towards your dreams. You know, there's an example that I share in the book. You go to the gym, you jump on the treadmill, the person next to you, Who's a, who's a female that looks, you know, in her thirties like you or whatever. And she's running at a faster speed and a higher incline. And you look at her and you go, Hmm, if she's running at that speed and that incline and she's, you know, looks like me, maybe I could. And so you up your speed and you up your incline and you finish that 20 minute run and you high five yourself and you are so proud because you did it. That is an example of using comparison as inspiration and motivation. And there's so many other stories that I share in the book as well. I love that so much. And I think you even say something like, but it can work both ways, right? So it's like you're on the treadmill, you're going, and then someone gets next to you and it's like, they're slower than you. And you can almost use that comparison as like fake, like cockiness, kind of like, oh, well, I'm running. And then you get someone else that comes and sits next to you, on, stands next to you on the other side. And now she's freaking whipping your ass. And so it can also then be, inspiration or it can be intimidation right where you, one side of it you feel good about yourself and the other side of it you actually feel worse about yourself but I want to pick up a story that you said in your book that I think is so much emotionally harder so the treadmill thing is very interesting right we can all be inspired by someone if we look at the possibility but you talk about you actually just said about getting pregnant so you talk about the situation where you're, you've been trying to get pregnant and then if you don't mind sharing the rest of the story, because I think that this is really true to how so many of us feel when our emotions are so tied up in that moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when I started writing the book, I was, my husband and I were calling in a baby. We wanted to be pregnant so much. Like my heart was yearning to be a mother. And that feeling literally flicked on for me one night. I had always thought that I'll have kids later, maybe down the track. And then literally one day I woke up and I rolled over to my husband and I said, I'm ready. I'm ready to have kids. And he was like, wow, what changed? What's <laughs> different? And I was like, it is just a feeling. And he was like, okay. And this was October. 
And so then um, we decided that we would do like a full protocol and a cleanse to get our bodies like really healthy. We did a lot of tests just to make sure that we were uh, thriving. And then January the following year, we decided to go for it. And January, we, we, we went for it. And then February, and then March, and then April, and then May, and then June. And by this point, my heart was ripped out of my chest and felt like it was shattered into a million pieces every month. It was so hard. It was, it caused a lot of stress in my relationship. I had such a deep yearning to be a mother and every month it was not happening and it was so hard. And I had, you know, spoken to a few friends and we decided let, let's do this together. Like let's get pregnant together. And it was the right time for them as well. And so one of them, you know, we were like, let's do this together. And then she got pregnant and then I didn't. And then another one was like, I'm going to get pregnant. I was like, cool, we're doing it too. So she got pregnant and then I didn't. And 18 months went by of this, 18 months. And I know like some people try for years, like three, four, five, eight years, and then their miracle happens. But for me, that 18 months was so hard. And uh, when one of my best friends toward the end of it, when she told me that she was pregnant, it was so hard, but I spoke about in the book, and this leads me into the third step in the ACEs technique, which is E, it stands for eliminate the trigger. You can eliminate, mm -hmm. exit, or exhale. And let me explain those three. So if there is a trigger on social media for someone who is, uh, you know, doing, uh, having babies and you can't, what you can do is you can just not spend as much time on your phone, you know, remove yourself. And this isn't about spiritually bypassing. This is just about removing yourself so that you can heal and take care of your soul, right? So eliminate the trigger. You can also then exit the situation. For example, if all of your friends are talking about, you know, their new men and or, or partners and they're out to dinner and you've just had your heart broken. Maybe you want to just get up and go for a walk. You don't have to sit there and you don't mm. have to, you know, um, pretend to be happy. You can just get up and just go for a walk and remove yourself. Just exit the situation or you can exhale, which is what I did when my friend told me that she was pregnant and I couldn't eliminate her. I didn't want to eliminate her. I didn't want to exit the situation because I'm not, it's just me and her. I'm not going to just get up and walk away. So in that moment, I just took a big exhale and I came back to the present moment. And I reminded myself that everything's always unfolding the way it's supposed to. And I was able to feel genuinely happy for her. And before that, it stung. It really stung. You know, when all my friends are getting pregnant and I'm still going, it really hurt. doesn't mean I don't love them any less. It doesn't mean that I wasn't happy for them. I am genuinely happy for them, but it still stung my heart. It really did because it was a reminder that my heart was still yearning to be a mother. For me in that phase in my life, when we were so wanting to call in a baby, I remember that the morning of, um, have you heard of mother's blessings? Do you know what a mother's blessing is? I don't. Okay, so a mother's blessing, or sometimes they're called a blessing way, that is a sacred spiritual ceremony that you do just before a mother gives birth. And it's basically like a women's circle and it's very sacred and very beautiful. And it's all about honoring the mother and loving on the mother. And we all go around and we share our wishes for her and the birth and the baby. And it's very beautiful. And we all weave red rope around our wrist and you are all connected by this beautiful, um, ceremony and the words and it's it's so much more than that and I and I wrote a whole post on it on my website and, and spoke about it on my podcast and I had a mother's blessing and it was the one of the best days of my life it was truly so beautiful and I organized one of my friends uh, when she was about to give birth just before she was about to give birth 
The morning of her blessing, it was a Saturday morning, that morning of her blessing, I had got dressed, um, I was ready to go and my period hadn't come. So I decided to do a pregnancy test. I did a pregnancy test with my husband that morning and it was negative. And I had to literally run out the door to her mother's blessing straight away. I couldn't, I didn't even have time to have a conversation with my husband about it. And so I, and then we all spent the weekend together. So it wasn't until Sunday night when I got home, I left Saturday morning, it was Sunday night when I got home, I was able to exhale and really feel how I felt. Um, but I kind of had to park my emotions mm -hmm. so that I could be the best friend that I could be to her in that moment. And it was really hard. It was a really hard time in my life, but I'm so glad as well that I did park it because that was, it was such a beautiful weekend and I was able to be fully present and I was able to show up for her and I had the most beautiful weekend. And then when I got home on Sunday, I had a big cry and was held by my husband, which was beautiful. But little did I know I was pregnant at that oh, time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yes. So that negative pregnancy test was actually a positive pregnancy test. <laughs> That's amazing. That's, um, okay. In moments like that, how were you able to park your emotions? Because there's so many scenarios where someone doesn't go or someone turns up and is the wet blanket or, you know, like the Debbie Downer, which rightly so. I mean, if your heart is broken, you know, there's no shame at all, but it, it is the case but you chose to park your emotions, celebrate your friends, and then go address your emotions. There is two things. And I think one was I had done so much healing around this by this time. This was mm -hmm. 18 months in that there was a deep level of trust that it would happen. You, you know, I knew by this time I was like, it's only a matter of time. You know, I've got to let go, surrender. It's only a matter of time. So there was that, that underlying level of trust. Mm. And I had a conversation with myself and I said, there's one of two options here, Melissa. And like uh, comparisonitis, you can either use it as motivation or you can go down that spiral of comparisonitis. And I had a conversation with myself and I said, Melissa, you can go to this weekend away and you can share and you can cry and you can make it all about you and you can be the Debbie Downer and the wet blanket and you can have a big cry and have all of your friends um, look after you and take care of you. Or you can park it and pick it back up on Sunday night when you get home and you can be there for your friend one of your best friends, you can be there for your friend. And I decided because I have that, had that deep level of trust, that underlying level of trust, I decided to park it. And I do this, you know, at night when I go to bed and if there is something on my mind, like I'm worrying or stressing about something, like we just moved house and the week before moving, I was like, okay, I've got to do this. And then I've got to do that. And then I was worrying about this. I literally would have a conversation with myself and I'd say, Melissa, you can park this now and you can pick it up in the morning. But right now it is sleep time. Your body needs rest. You need to go to bed and you can pick this up in the morning. I literally have that conversation with myself and I have that conversation often. And I had that conversation before I went to my best friend's mother's blessing. I said, one or two options, Melissa, what are you going to choose? And I decided to park it till Sunday. And I am so glad I did because I had such a brilliant time because I was able to be present. I was able to show up. And if I had a, you know, brought my stuff to the party, it would have taken me out of the present moment and made it all about me and not being able to show up for my friend the way that I truly wanted to. God, that is so admirable, so beautiful. I, I think that there's a third option, which is interesting that you didn't consider it. And I'd be curious to know why, because this actually, the third option will probably be what I would go to is don't go. Like, Feel your feels, don't have the negative effect on other people, but don't ignore your feelings. And so 
I say almost about my business, but I think this really does apply here, is like, don't compare your beginning to my middle or my end. So for instance, it's like for people now to, um, if they, if someone hasn't done the work like you did, I wouldn't want them to compare themselves to you and be like, well, Melissa was able to go to this event and be happy. Um, because that could actually be detrimental to them if they're just starting out. So they're comparing their beginning, right, to where you are maybe in your middle or your end that you're able to park your emotions and still go to the event. So what would you say to someone like that? Because my instinct would be like, oh, stay at home, feel your feels and tell your friends, sorry, you can't make it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And, And I think that's a really important point. Don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle or end. Don't be don't compare your middle to someone else's end just don't compare yourself in an unhealthy and toxic way and me years before that I probably wouldn't have gone Mm. um I would have you know just stayed home and I may have regretted it but in this situation um I knew I, it was really important for me to be there. It was very, and I'm so glad it was very important. And I was organizing the whole thing and I was running the whole day. So it really needed me to be there. It needed me to orchestrate the entire event. That's kind of like saying, don't show up for your Ted talk, you know, like <laughs> you kind of, no one else can fill in for you, you know, like you are the, the person. So, um, And, you know, I love that piece as well because that is about honouring where you're at. Mm. And sometimes you do just need to say, you know what, I I can't come and this is not a reflection on you at all. I love you so much. And this is where practising what I call crystal clear communication, this is where practising crystal clear communication is really important because what, a lot of people do is they just don't go and they don't share why they're not going. And then the other person on the other end just thinks, what have, have I done something to upset her? Like, why doesn't she want to come? Like, have I done something? Did I say something, you know, and then it causes that person stress, which is unnecessary. So practice crystal clear communication and just say, Hey, babe, you know, I know today is really important to you. Um, I'm really feeling sad, emotional, upset about X, Y, and Z. I don't feel like I can show up as the best version of myself today. Um, And because of that, I'm not going to be able to come. I love you so much. This is not a reflection on my love for you. I'm just really struggling right now with X and I would love to share more about it with you in the coming weeks, but right now you just go be present, have the best time. I love you. I'm thinking of you and release that person because you don't want them sitting there thinking that they've done something wrong when they absolutely haven't. And it's all your stuff. So if you are going to not go, then definitely have that crystal clear communication with that person um, or park it and go and enjoy yourself and be present in the moment and have fun. Um, Yeah, you've got a couple of options and ultimately you have to do what feels right and true for you in the moment. Girl, that's so beautiful because um, I like, I really love the communication piece. That is so important, I think, because we tell ourselves our own stories, right? And so if everything we're talking about, especially when it comes to comparisonitis, I think that we have it with a lot of people that we end up being close with, because we see the, you know, we see a lot of it. And so we, um, you know, like the baby thing, it's like, they already know you're struggling, you know, that they've been trying, you guys have kind of been in this together. And now like, they've got it. And there becomes these emotions where it's like, you feel the shame, you feel the guilt that you're not showing up for your friend so you try not to say anything you try to pretend but your your friend senses it so now therefore your friend's like why is she mad like is it about me and like and then we end up telling ourselves this whole freaking story and before you know you've got an argument and two years later you're not friends anymore and neither of you have any idea about why you ended up having this beautiful friendship that ended up being completely fractured and it comes that back down to I think 
we feel the shame of being com- uh, comparing ourselves in the first place. So we don't articulate it. We then don't give our friend the opportunity to show up for us. And it becomes this like really freaking vicious cycle where we're in our heads and we become paralyzed because we don't almost know how to handle it. Yeah, absolutely. This is why I wrote Open Wide, a radically real guide to deep love, rocking relationships and soulful sex because relationships are so important, right? Mm -hmm. And so many of them get fractured because we're not practicing crystal clear communication. It is imperative, not only with others, but with ourselves too. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure we're being clear with ourselves and open and honest with ourselves. Like that's the most important relationship of all. Oh God, that's so true. Um, I really, really, really want to touch on self-sabotage. So as I was reading your book and just thinking about where all the traps we all kind of fall into, especially being women, especially being women in, you know, this gener- this day and age where you've got the social media, you've got access to, you know, seeing your friends all over the place. Um, and so having someone that you can admire, you said earlier, you can use as utter inspiration, um, what if though your mind immediately goes to self-sabotage? So we're all told a story when we're kids, right? And the story we can then take into adulthood. So we can believe something about ourselves. So now let's say we have a situation where people are at home and you tell this story in your book where they're like, oh my God, I love Melissa. Oh my God, her book is so freaking amazing. There's no way I can write a book as good as Melissa. So I'm not even going to pick up a pen in the first place. Oh, Yeah. Self-sabotage, oof. Self-sabotage is, it's big for a lot of people and it will stop you from following your dreams. It will stifle your creativity and it's often other people can see it in you before you can see it in yourself. I've definitely noticed it in different people. I've got a friend who sabotages every relationship but she wants to be in a relationship, but she sabotages every one of them. You know, I've got another friend who sabotages her health by overeating and she, she's constantly, you know, struggling with eating issues. So I think self-sabotage is a big area that a lot of people struggle with, and it doesn't have to be your reality. You can use the inspiration from other people as fuel to propel you forward. That is literally how I use any sort of comparison. Now I see someone else starts a podcast. I'm going to start a podcast. That's what I want to do. I saw someone else write books. I want to write books. I saw someone else have a home or a beautiful home birth. I want to, I want to have a home birth. I saw someone else have a dream relationship with their soulmate. That's what I want. I saw someone else have their dream home. That's what I want. And I went for it. And I haven't always thought like that. Like that hasn't always been my default. My default was lack, Mm. but lack is so boring. And that default caused me a lot of suffering that I chose a different path. The second step in the ACEs technique. I chose a different path. So my old choice was suffering and I was so bored of that. I was so bored of the suffering that I decided there's gotta be another way. And that other way was to use it as fuel to propel me forward. So now I don't slip into that self-sabotage. I choose to use it as fuel to push me forward. Okay, I love that so much. Take me to your friends, though, because I think so many, this is so common. Your friend who desperately wants to be in a beautiful, loving relationship. I just met your husband before we started rolling. You guys seem so sweet together. And so let's assume your friend is looking at you. Oh, my gosh, she's got such a beautiful relationship. I really want to be in a relationship. But I don't understand. Every time I'm with these guys, like it just never works out. And so that's her story that she's telling herself. But you from the outside can see that it's self-sabotage. So take me through what you're seeing that maybe she isn't. And then if someone is listening right now in that situation, what can you say to them to make them recognize, oh, this is me without feeling badly, right? Because that's the key without feeling badly to recognize that they're self-sabotaging because the beautiful thing is, I think if you can recognize it, then you have the power to change it. But for your friend, 
the same story, I assume that she's telling her the same, herself the same story, that she can't find anybody, but you're saying it's self-sabotage. Yeah, so she keeps attracting these same men and it doesn't work out and um, it's a very unhealthy relationship. And she, okay, so what you really would ideally, like radical honesty, radical Yeah, truth, give it to me, girl. Like what you really want to say to them is, hey, babe, you are completely self-sabotaging. Can you see that every guy you get with, um, you do this, this, and this? Like, well, that's what you really want to say. Mm. However, no one wants to be told anything. Like you look at children, they don't want to be told what to do. Do you like being told what to do? I sure as hell do not like being told <laughs> what to do. I don't like it. So it's about asking the right questions. It's about asking the questions that opens them up and allows them to go deeper within themselves. So you could say something like, hey, babe, how does it feel when you get in a relationship and they do X, Y, and Z? How does that feel for you? And then she might go, oh, well, it feels like this. And then you can say, and then how does that make you feel? So you ask these mm. open-ended questions. You don't tell them what you see. You ask really open-ended, amazing questions that allow them to go deeper within themselves. So if you see anyone that you love self-sabotaging with food, relationships, career, their health, whatever it is, ask some really great questions that allow them to go deeper within themselves and to come up with the answer themselves. Because mm -hmm. when we come up with the answer ourselves, it's way more powerful than being told. So true. That's so true. Um, you actually spoke, um, you just said like with food, but it made me um, remember something you, you talk about in your book about how so many of us numb out and we use things like food alcohol, parties, sex, guys, all these things to numb out so that we don't feel the shame, guilt, distress, sadness, and all these other emotions that come with um, comparisonitis. So um, can you talk to me about that? Mm. Yeah, so all of those feelings that you just described, fear, sadness, shame, guilt, whatever it is, they're all just emotions like every feeling that we have every emotion is just energy in motion and it's going to pass same as happiness joy um mm. anything anything good or, or bad and let's just label them i try not to label them as good as um, or bad but you know any of the happy feelings and any, any of the not so happy feelings we all feel them and they're all fleeting they're all passing i like to visualize it i live on the beach so i like to visualize it like a wave washing over you the wave just washes over you, right? You can't stop a wave. You can't be like, wave, do not go any further. <laughs> like guilt, do not go any further. Sadness, do not go any further. You can't do that, right? Like you can't stop a wave. It's going to wash over you I love anyway, right? Your emotions, your feelings, they're going to wash over you anyway. And so we need to just let them wash over us, let it wash over us and not try and stop it because anytime we try and stop something or push it under the carpet, it, eventually it's going to be like a volcano and it's going to erupt and explode. So it's really important that we feel whatever it is that is coming up for us, feel our emotions and then remember that they're just energy and motion, that you aren't the guilt, you aren't the fear, mm. you aren't the sadness. You know, in um, have you heard of internal family systems? No. In internal family systems, they get you to reframe your language and say things like, there's a part of me that feels sad. There's a part of me that feels guilty. Like, and I use, I add in another bit. There's a tiny part of me that feels sad. There's a tiny part of me that feels shame. There's a tiny part of me that feels guilt. And I visualize it like, you know, a tiny, tiny piece, like, you know, a, a coin, right? There's a part of me that feels that. 
That is not who I am. I am not the guilt. And because a lot of us use language like, I feel sad, I feel guilty. Coming back full circle, our words are spells, (laughs) right? So if we're constantly saying, I feel sad, I feel guilty, I feel tired, I feel whatever, that's what we're going to create in our life. And so reframing it to, there's a tiny part of me that feels sad and and that's okay. I'm just going to allow that sadness to wash over me. And when you fully allow yourself to feel it, it passes. All feelings last around nine seconds if we fully feel them. But what most of us do is they go, I don't want to feel it. And we push it down. We push it down. We suppress it and we sweep it under the carpet. And we're like, I don't want to feel it. It's too scary. It's too scary. But if we just open our arms and allow ourselves to let that emotion wash over us, it passes in like nine seconds. So reframe your language around your feelings and emotions. That is something that has radically shifted for me, shifted so much for me. And how did you start to reframe that? Was it going back to the awareness piece where you just started to take note and inventory of what you were saying? And then as each word comes up, you start to reframe what that word should mean, can mean, I don't like to use the word should, can mean, Yeah, absolutely. It was the awareness piece. And I also, you know, tuned in with my body. How does it feel when I say, I feel Mm -hmm. guilty? Mm -hmm. How does that feel? It doesn't feel good. How does it feel when I say, I can't do this? How does it feel when I say, I'm so tired? How does it feel when I say those things? And it didn't feel good. And so Mm -hmm. I just started to reframe it. It all came back to awareness. I just started to reframe it. You know, I want to live my life feeling good. I want to feel good. We all want to feel good. I don't want to feel contracted. I don't want to, not that I'm suppressing those things, but my higher self wants to feel good on a daily basis. I want to feel healthy. I want to feel strong. I want to feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I'm going to lean more towards the things that allow me to feel that and then walk away from the things that don't. And that goes for every area of our life. Lean more towards the relationships that light you up. Lean more towards the work that lights you up. Lean more towards the foods that light you up, the experiences that light you up, the opportunities that light you up and walk away from the ones that don't. That is how you create the life of your dreams. You fill it, fill it with the things that light you up and then slowly all the other things get pushed down and out, you know, it's like crowding in. We want to crowd in with all the goodness and soon that will be your reality, you know, just a life overflowing with what lights you up, what brings you joy. And that doesn't mean you have to have a podcast and do TED Talks and write books. That means that you could be the best partner, the best mama, the best school teacher, whatever it is. We all have this magic inside us and there is absolutely no need to compare yourself in an unhealthy, toxic way to anyone else. Use it as inspiration and motivation. Absolutely. Yes. But remember that you don't need to spiral into comparisonitis because you matter. You have magic. No one is you. No one has your uniqueness, your magic. We're all so different and that is the beauty. And we need to share that with the world. And most importantly, allow ourselves to fully express it. You know, I am the, there's, there's one thing that I can say hand on heart that I am the best in the entire world at, and that is not dancing (laughs) because there's people better than me, but I am the best in the entire world at being Melissa Ambrosini. And you are the best in the entire world at being Lisa Bilyeu. You're the best. No one else can be you. Mm. No one else can do you like you do you. And so remember that, remember that you are the best in the world at you. You are so magical. You have so much to share with others and to just allow yourself to be who you truly are and to share that with the world, which I want to share the final step. Oh my God, I can't believe we haven't even done the final step. 
<laughs> I get so carried away with what you're saying. <laughs> well, the final step S in the ACEs technique. So we've covered A, awareness, C, choosing a different path, E, eliminate, exit, or exhale. S is shifting your state. So what I mean by that is when we feel, when we compare ourselves, how does it feel? It feels really crap. It feels <laughs> shit. It doesn't feel good. And we all know what it feels like when we compare ourselves to others. And so S, shift your state, right? Once you have become aware, once you have chosen a different path, once you have exited or eliminated or exhaled, I want you to get up and I want you to put on your favorite Beyonce track or whatever lights you up. And I want you to shake out, dance out, sing out that energy out of your body. Okay. Tony Robbins calls it changing your state. I call it shifting your state. Jump on a rebounder. Just move that energy because everything is energy. Like we said before, move that energy out of your body. So for me, I love dancing. Sometimes I'll even just shake it out, shake my whole body. It doesn't matter what you do, but just shift that energy out of your body. Go for a swim, have a shower, have a bath. Just do something to help get that energy out of your body. So that is the ACEs technique. A stands for awareness. C, choosing a different path. E, eliminating, exhaling or exiting. And then S, shifting your state. That's beautiful. Would you do that same technique um, no matter what the situation was then? So I started to think about external validation. And I start to think about when you're a kid and you have your parents and everyone's like praising your sibling. Right? Oh, he's so smart. This is what exactly. I mean, literally, I'm, in fact, I'm going to give you a real time example. My, my brother and sister who are older than me, only a year and a half difference between me and my sister and my sister and my brother. So we're all very close. My dad would throw out math quizzes and I was the only one that wasn't great at math. And so every, like when we'd sit at dinner, the math quizzes would come out. My brother and sister would answer them. And here I am because I'm a sibling. I don't, I'm not as quick. So literally I feel like the dumb one. So as you're a kid, it's so hard to understand the external validation and understand, and you do take it personally. So as you get older, I started to realize that my, I was seeking external validation because it stems from the childhood. Mm. So this ACEs, when I was a kid, it, I don't even know that it exists, right? I don't understand, I'm not sure. So I'm carrying this whole load of 20, 30 years of feeling inadequate because of the comparison that I've had from external validation from my parents. Isn't that wild? Yes. Isn't that wild? How old were you when that when your dad started throwing out those quizzes? As early as I can remember. So probably like seven, eight. And isn't that wild that something like that, that happens when you're that young, forms a story in our mind. We make it mean something like I'm dumb and we then carry that for our entire life or, you know, maybe our parents didn't show up and then I'm unlovable, right. you know, that, you know, and then we carry that through our whole life or whatever the story is, isn't that wild? And it makes me realize now being a parent, how powerful our role is. We are shaping our children. Like, like I said at the very start, mm -hmm. They are copying everything we do and we say. And so it's really important that we take our role as a parent really seriously. Be mindful of your dialogue. Be mindful of your actions. Like how can anyone not realize that by doing that, you may make someone else who is not as quick with those math questions how can you not realize that that may make that person feel insecure? Like it takes a very basic level of awareness for someone to realize that, hey, that might not feel good for Lisa, you know? So that's why I say parenting is personal development. It gets mm. you to look within at every action and every word that you say. So I love that you brought that up. And I want everyone to get out a pen and paper after this and ask yourself, are there any stories that you're carrying forward? 
from your childhood. I'm unlovable, I'm dumb, I'm fat, I'm not good enough, whatever it is, whatever the story is, are there any that you are carrying from your childhood? And I invite you now to feel the feelings around that story and then let it go because it is stopping you from being the best version of you. It is blocking your flow. It is stifling your creativity. So I invite you to let go of any of those stories that are not serving your highest self. Girl, this has been so much freaking fun. You are absolutely fire. Your book is absolutely amazing. So Comparisonitis, where can people go and find your book, Comparisonitis, and then find out more about you? And I was like trying to think of something really smart. And I was like, where can people get the antidote to Comparisonitis, the disease that is very much um, crippling so many of us? Oh, okay. Go to melissaambrosini.com. And you can get all of my books there, all of my uh, meditations. You can check out uh, my podcast, The Melissa Ambrosini Show, and your episode on there, which is amazing. We talk all about your amazing book. And come and follow me on Instagram, at Melissa Ambrosini, and tell me what you got from this conversation. I absolutely love connecting with you and uh, hearing from you and hearing what you got out of this episode. So please come and share it with me. Hell yeah! Guys, 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 I had so much fun reading this book. Her analogy of it being a disease that we can cure is so freaking beautiful. And you know me, I'm all about tactics. Like, I just embrace this is who I am. But how on earth can I use tactics in order to improve my life and get better and be better and grow and change to be the person that I really want to be? So, guys, go check out her book. Go check her out. Check out her podcast. This woman is fire. If you're not following me, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribe click that subscribe button down there guys and until next time be the hero of your own life peace it's the lies we tell ourselves Mm. they hurt us the most i'm no good nobody will want me i got nothing to offer everyone has something to offer the world everyone